morning everybody i hope you all able to access the broadcast of today's lecture if there are any questions you can ask so that we can have some recapitulation before i start with my lecture good morning so are there any questions how did how did your exams go i hope the internal assessment paper for the introductory astronomy course was all right good morning ankit uh, the hubble's constant does not give exactly the age of the universe for example if the universe was matter dominated and a flat universe then 2 by 3 hubble's constant will give you the age of the universe to a very good accuracy but we know that the universe is not matter dominated at the moment because there is evidence for accelerated expansion of the universe but approximately 1 divided by the hubble parameter today that is 1 divided by h not gives a good approximation to the age of the universe and that is the reason why the astronomers they try to measure the hubble parameter h not to a very good accuracy currently there is a tension in the values of the hubble parameter h not that has been estimated from different uh, kinds of measurement so the value of the hubble parameter h not from cosmic micro background studies gives you a value that is closer to something like 68 kilometers per second per megaparsec while measurements of the hubble parameter h not from uh, galaxies that are not very far from our galaxy that seems to be giving a value which is closer to 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec and uh, there is hectic research activity to find out uh, how to remove this tension in the two different uh, estimated values for the hubble parameter are there any other questions all right so 
let's get on with the lecture to recapitulate we have this relation that if there is any source that emits radiation in an isotropic manner and let's say the source is having a luminosity l that means every second it emits l amount of energy in an isotropic fashion then we know that if the geometry is described by euclidean geometry that we all learn in our school while um, studying mathematics then l amount of energy which is being emitted every second as the energy spreads out with the speed c at a distance r the energy l is distributed over a surface area 4 pi r square and therefore the energy per unit area per unit time that crosses this 4 pi r square area is given by the flux flux by definition is the energy crossing per unit area a surface at a distance r per unit time so in other words if a source is at a distance d then in a euclidean uh, geometry the flux is related to the luminosity by this equation all right and therefore we have to find out some source whose luminosity can be inferred independently so that by measuring the flux we can estimate the distance d and this is something uh, we talked about earlier also but uh, as i have mentioned in a uh, few lectures ago astronomer enrietta levitt she found out that the variable stars called cepheid variable for which the absolute magnitude varies periodically over time and when enrietta levitt she plotted the magnitude versus the absolute magnitude versus log of the period she found out a linear correlation the absolute magnitude versus the period log period she found a linear correlation and that completely changed the way astronomers estimated the distance of objects that are very very far away and how uh, this discovery facilitated the distance measurement the idea was very simple period of variability can be measured by looking at the cepheid variables in different galaxies and if the period can be estimated accurately then its absolute magnitude can be obtained by the relation discovered by enrietta levitt and once we know the absolute magnitude since apparent magnitude can be measured and we already know the relation between the apparent magnitude and the absolute magnitude apparent magnitude minus absolute magnitude is 5 into log base 10 of the distance in units of parsec okay minus okay uh, yeah minus 5 um so this is a relation uh, if you remember we had discussed this relation and uh, based on this relation i had also asked you questions 
So therefore, absolute magnitude can be determined from the Henrietta Leavitt relation for the CFID variables. Apparent magnitude is measured, and therefore, the distance to the source can be measured. There is another standard candle, and this standard candle is called the Type 1A supernova. Some lectures back, I had talked about one kind of supernova, namely the Type 2 supernova, where a star whose core mass is more than 1.4 solar mass that can undergo gravitational collapse because its core mass is greater than the Chandrasekhar limit and thereby the gravitational energy minus GMC square by initial size of the core, where MC is the mass of the core, that energy liberated uh, leads to the explosion of the envelope of the star and the core collapses either to a neutron star or a black hole depending upon the mass of the core. Such supernovae are called type 2 supernovae. But there can be another type of supernovae called the type 1a supernovae in which you have a binary star in which one of the stars is a white dwarf. All right. So imagine two stars moving about the common center of mass in which one of the two stars is a white dwarf. The other star is still evolving. And let's say after some time, the other star becomes a red supergiant or a blue giant. The idea is that if it becomes a giant, then the mass from the surface of this giant star can start falling onto the white dwarf. So white dwarf starts accreting matter from its companion and therefore, the mass of the white dwarf keeps white dwarf keeps increasing. But we know that the mass cannot exceed beyond the Chandrasekhar limit. So when the mass of the white dwarf, because of the matter being accreted onto the white dwarf, once the white dwarf star just exceeds 1.4 solar mass the white dwarf simply collapses and it collapses leading to either a neutron star or a black hole, but the envelope explodes and such a supernova is called type 1 A supernova. And several researchers have shown that from the light curve of the type 2 supernova, so if you plot the magnitude as a function of time, the light curve for different type 1 a supernova has differences, but they can all be normalized so that they the absolute magnitude of type 1 a supernova can be corrected to a single curve. All right. And therefore, the type 1 a supernova can also act as a standard candle. So this is another standard candle which is being used to measure the distance of far away galaxies. As we know that there are different kinds of galaxies. So here there is a spiral galaxy and the spiral galaxy could be having CFID variables here, type 1A supernovae going off here and by looking at the Cifid variables or type 1a supernovae, one can therefore estimate the distance of such spiral galaxies or elliptical galaxies. So this is M87, the elliptical galaxy, which was uh, uh, in recent news because of the Event Horizon Telescope mapping 
the supermassive black hole at the heart of M87. This is another spiral galaxy which has many, many different arms. This is an elliptical galaxy with a dust lane so that this galaxy with the dust lane appears like a Mexican hat and that's the reason why this galaxy is called Sombrero Galaxy. And we have already seen this picture before. This is the Hubble classification of galaxies where we have uh, the elliptical galaxies, we have the spiral galaxies without bars and barred spiral galaxies. There are irregular galaxies, but today we have many other kinds of galaxies like dwarf galaxies, lenticular galaxies, and so on. And this is the relative size of an elliptical galaxy like M87 compared to the spiral galaxies like Andromeda or Milky Way galaxy or Whirlpool galaxy, etc. Right. So, the study of the universe, because when you look at the universe using a powerful telescope, you'll find that the amidst the empty spaces which appear dark, there are bright objects like elliptical galaxies, spiral galaxies, etc., which are essentially the building blocks of the universe. And the branch of physics called cosmology, it studies the origin, composition, large-scale distribution of matter, as well as the evolution of the matter, as well as the large-scale structure of the space-time. And therefore, cosmology is a very rich subject which needs knowledge of different areas of physics, mathematics, and chemistry. And this is galaxies which are bound in the form of cluster. And we will come to the clusters of galaxies when we talk about dark matter. Here is a zoomed version of a cluster of galaxies. As you can see, there are many, many different kinds of galaxies which are gravitationally bound to each other. You can see these arches. The arches are due to the gravitational lensing of a background object due to this massive cluster. As you know, Einstein's general relativity predicts that light can be bent because of the space-time curvature induced by massive object. So these arches are the bent light from a source that lies behind these cluster of galaxies. This is a snapshot of the universe. Uh, in which the survey, this, this is the so-called APM galaxy survey, where every bright spot is a galaxy. And as you can see, the large scale structure of matter is in the form of filaments, shells, voids, and so on. So therefore, you can ask, in cosmology, therefore, what do we presently think of how the large scale matter is evolving with time? Now, in the just before uh, the break, that is the last lecture before your internal assessment exam, I talked about the emission lines and the absorption lines from stars and the gaseous matter around the stars and the use of Saha's equation to estimate different ionized states of elements. So emission lines, absorption lines tell us about the composition of gaseous matter in the star, around the stars, and these stars are 
essentially in the galaxies as bound systems and therefore one can study the emission lines absorption lines from a distant galaxy now what happened was that hubble edwin hubble he was studying the lines emission lines as well as absorption lines that showed up when he was looking at different galaxies and using the henrietta levitt uh, relation hubble also estimated the distance of these galaxies independently and what he found was the lines that were being observed they were shifted with respect to the lines corresponding lines from the elements that were measured in the laboratory on earth now these shifts could arise due to either doppler shift for example we know that if a source which is emitting let's say sodium Uh, light as you know the sodium light as a distinct doublet the yellow doublet lines and if your sodium lamp was moving away from you then the doublet lines the wavelength will be longer than the wavelength that is measured using a prism or a diffraction grating uh, on earth for a stationary sodium lamp source while if the sodium lamp was moving with a great velocity towards you the wavelength measured of those two doublets will be shifted towards shorter wavelength that means if a source is moving away the wavelength gets doppler red shifted while if the source is moving towards you the wavelength gets doppler blue shifted so hubble when he obtained all these spectroscopic lines for different galaxies and he had already measured the distance of the galaxies using the cepheid variable he plotted what he thought was a doppler shift of these lines and therefore he plotted the inferred velocity from the doppler shift and when he plotted the inferred velocity against the distance he found a linear relation so this is a sort of cartoon of the plot between the inferred velocity of the galaxies away from us because the lines of these galaxies distant galaxies were all red shifted that means the wavelength of hydrogen or calcium or magnesium they were stretched to longer uh, wavelength compared to what the wavelength is measured for uh, the calcium lines or the magnesium lines or the hydrogen lines um on earth based laboratories and when hubble as you know in science we try to find out is there a causal correlation between one set of variable with another set of variable and such causal correlations are studied um in every discipline of science whether it is biology chemistry or physics and when he when hubble plotted the inferred velocity he thought that the redshift of the lines that he observed were due to galaxies moving away from us and therefore he inferred the velocity and when he plotted the velocity as a function of the distance the distance was independently estimated using the cepheid uh, absolute magnitude period relation he found a scatter diagram 
and but the scatter showed that the points were linearly correlated that means the recessional velocity inferred from the stretched wavelength were correlated with the distance of the galaxies from the earth and hubble immediately concluded that this means that the universe is expanding why did he conclude that here by the way i must pause and uh, tell you a little bit of history hubble's discovery dates to 1929 now it turns out that friedman in 1922 had obtained solutions using einstein's equation by assuming that the universe in the universe the matter is distributed homogeneously and isotropically that means no matter where you are in the universe the density is same and no matter in which direction you are looking the density of the matter is more or less identical so assumption of homogeneity and isotropy led friedman to obtain solutions from einstein's equation which is part of general relativity and friedman obtained solutions that corresponded either an expanding universe or a contracting universe George Lemaitre a physicist but who also had become a bishop in a church independently he belonged to belgium and he independently he had obtained the same kind of solutions that friedman had obtained but he published them in obscure journals in uh, belgian language so not many people had those uh, wrote, read those uh, papers of george lemaitre but george lemaitre also predicted that our universe should be described by expanding friedman lemaitre model <coughs> this was few years before the hubble's discovery of the big bang universe all right hubble's relation that recession velocity is proportional to the distance and the proportionality constant is what today we call as h not the hubble parameter to pay tribute to hubble's uh, observational discovery now hubble of course talked about a big bang model from this relation by using simple argument not the friedman lemaitre uh, model which was based on einstein general relativity hubble's argument that this observed relation namely the recession velocity being proportional to distance of a galaxy hubble gave a very simple very simple model for it he said that look you find that further away a galaxy is greater is its velocity how can that simply be explained so hubble's explanation was that supposing the universe was created in an explosive manner some time back and galaxies were thrown out with different velocities when the universe got created so imagine that there was a big explosion and the galaxies got created and they were all created moving with different velocities then hubble argued that those galaxies 
which were created with greater velocity would move to greater distances where the universe was created at a fixed time so today the galaxies that were flung out with greater velocity would have traveled to larger distances while galaxies that were thrown out with smaller velocities would have traveled only small uh, amount relatively small amount of uh, distance so this simple picture hubble said that his discovered relation tells us that the universe was created at some time with a great violence the so called big bang model but today we know that hubble's simplified model uh, cannot be correct uh, because first of all even if the universe was created from a point it will not be created in terms of galaxies rather matter will be created at high density and high temperature so hubble assumed that the universe was created directly in the form of galaxies second point was that today we know that the redshift that is observed is not really the velocity of the galaxies it is really redshift is appearing because it is the distance between the galaxies which is increasing with time because einstein general relativity tells us that the space time geometry is what uh gives rise to gravitation and the friedman lemaitre geometry tells us tell us that it is a distance between two points that keeps increasing uh with time it is not that the points themselves are moving with uh velocity and the third point is that it cannot be velocities because there are galaxies with red shifts more than 6 so they cannot arise due to doppler uh, velocities because red shift 6 means these galaxies have to be then moving close to the speed of light but if they were moving with respect to in uh, intergalactic medium with such high velocities then there'll be shock waves that will be produced which will be emitting in great radiation such shock waves are not seen around the galaxies so today we know that the hubble relation is not uh, as a result of the kinematical velocity of the galaxies uh, rather uh, it is due to the expansion of uh, the universe as it is all right uh, we can i have probably also shown um a figure uh, earlier the real way of explaining the expanding universe is to um give the example of a stretched rubber sheet imagine you have a rubber sheet and you put dots on it each dot representing a galaxy and if the rubber sheet is stretched then the distance between dots would keep on increasing although the dots themselves will not change in size and it is this kind of analogy which is uh, better than um, speaking about the um let me give you a better example so uh let me show a better slide one moment
yeah so here we have a better uh, view of the slide that i was earlier uh, showing so the real uh, a good analogy of why the wavelength gets stretched to the red end can be uh, illustrated using this example so if you have a uh, rubber band and the wave the wavelength as you know the wavelength is the distance between two neighboring troughs or two neighboring um, two neighboring troughs or two neighboring peaks but if you stretch the rubber band then the wavelength also increases so this is a better way to illustrate why when hubble was looking at a more distant galaxy why was it seeing that the wavelength was more redshifted because if you are looking at a very distant galaxy then light emitted from the galaxy would take a long time to reach us over that long time to reach the universe would have expanded more and that's the reason why the wavelength for a more distant galaxy gets stretched out more all right so this is a better uh, analogy than the hubble kind of uh, picture where galaxies are thrown out uh, with velocities so in other words the real reason why hubble observed hubble or later astronomers now it has become a routine work for astronomers to measure the redshift of quasars of very distant galaxies um, and the right interpretation of the redshift is that the universe is described by general relativity and the general relativity says that the space time um for a homogeneous and isotropic uh, matter distribution um case the space time can either contract the geometry tells us that the either you have a contracting geometry or an expanding geometry and as george lemaitre had argued that our universe is expanding and hubble essentially corroborated it using uh, his observation and uh, what therefore we see is that we can it's just an analogy we can think of the, our universe to be uh, a two dimensional space although our spatial dimension of the universe is three dimension but imagine that if our universe was two dimensional so that it can be painted on the surface of a balloon and as time goes on if the balloon keeps getting inflated then the distance between any two point on the balloon would keep on increasing although the points themselves are not having velocity with respect to uh, the balloon itself so this is a better analogy of describing why hubble obtain an expanding um uh, the stretch why he obtained redshifted wavelength so in other words the hubble law that came about from observation tells us that the universe is expanding like how when you bake a, a bread in the oven how initially the dough the dough of the bread it is the volume is less if you had put some raisins or uh, cherries in the dough so these dark points are either nuts or uh, raisins or cherries and as you heat the dough the dough that makes up the bread that expands but the nuts or the cherries they themselves don't expand so in other words you can think of them as the galaxies and it is the distance between 
the galaxy that keeps on increasing because of the expansion of the universe. So in other words, the expansion is only on scales larger than 500 megaparsec. So things which are on shorter scales, they don't expand. That means you are not expanding, I am not expanding, Earth is not expanding, Sun is not expanding. Only when you go to scales over 500 million parsec, the scale, what is the scale? This is the scale on which the universe appears homogeneous and isotropic. On such scales, the universe expands. Right. So this is the summary that the what Hubble discovered uh, today when we inter uh, interpret using general relativity, the, what we see is it is a distance between the galaxies that is increasing and um, it is not that the galaxies are having velocity. And the expansion also leads to expansion or stretching of the wavelength of light that goes from one galaxy to another galaxy. And that is the reason why Hubble had measured the redshift. So now we know that the Hubble's observation of velocity versus distance of the galaxy should be reinterpreted. It is not the velocity really, it is the expansion, it is the rate at which the scale factor describing the scale of the universe, that how it increases with time. Now, the real, so this is the summary of the Big Bang model. Uh, don't bother if you don't understand the various epochs of the Big Bang. So Big Bang essentially tells us that 13.8 billion years or so ago, at every point on the space, the universe got created with matter having infinite density and infinite temperature. Remember, the infinity is coming out because we are using classical general relativity. And that is the reason why we say it's a Big Bang singularity. But we know that singularities, that means whenever infinities appear, the theory breaks down. And this tells us that at the time of creation of the universe, we can't use general theory of relativity. There must be a theory that incorporates quantum aspects of gravitation. And when that is used, the singularity will disappear. And so universe was, you can think of universe being created about 13.8 billion years ago in a state of matter in which the matter was having a very large density, very high temperature and the, this was created at every space point, spatial point, not at a single space point. How can we be sure? Remember, we are working in the framework where the matter is homogeneous and isotropic. That means there is no preferred point. So therefore, it is you should remove from your mind the Hubble picture that the Big Bang happened at a single point. No, the Big Bang happened at every point of space, but at a given instant, which is 13.8 billion years or so from now, and Big Bang, meaning high density and high temperature matter, uh, started expanding at every point. And as it, as it expanded, it started cooling down. And initially, the universe was in the plasma form. Electrons and protons, they were all separated where the temperature was very high. But when the universe dropped, the temperature of the universe dropped 
below about 10,000 degree Kelvin, then the electron and hydrogen combine to form neutral hydrogen atoms. Now here, let me take a pause and uh, explain to you what is happening really. You all know that the ground state energy of hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 electron volt. What do I mean by the ground state energy? Hydrogen atom has one proton and one electron. And when you solve the Schrodinger equation, you find that there are various energy levels characterized by the principal quantum number n. n equal to 1 corresponds to the minimum energy and the minimum energy for the hydrogen atom, the electronic state of the hydrogen atom is minus 13.6 electron volt corresponding to the principal quantum number n equal to 1. What this signifies is that if I want to ionize the hydrogen atom, that means if I want to break up the hydrogen atom into proton and electron, then the minimum energy that I need to break up a hydrogen atom to proton and electron is 13.6 electron volt. Because the ground state energy is minus 13.6 electron volt, if I supply 13.6 electron volt, then electron proton can be separated there's a minimum required so that the energy is zero. And zero meaning the proton and electron are very far away from each other. So, when the universe cooled below 10,000 degree Kelvin, only then the protons and electrons could combine to form neutral hydrogen atom. Why is it so? Remember the equivalence. One electron volt, if I want to find out what should be the temperature of the ambient so that the typical particles have energy one electron volt. Now, we all know we have been doing this earlier also from equipartition theorem of statistical mechanics, we know that when particles are in thermodynamic equilibrium and the temperature is T, then on an average, a particle has energy of the order of killer uh, Kb, where Kb is the Boltzmann constant, times the temperature. Because the equipartition theorem states that with every degree of freedom, the average energy corresponding to every degree of freedom is half kbt. So, one electron volt, that means if I want to find out what is the <clears throat> average energy of a particle in thermodynamic equilibrium such that average energy of a particle is one electron volt, so I equate one electron volt with Kb multiplied by the temperature measured in uh, degree Kelvin. Then you will find, you can do a simple exercise, set one electron volt is equal to Kb into T and one electron volt in units of ergs is about 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 12 erg. That means one electron volt is about 1.6 into 10 to the power minus 12 erg, then you will find that the temperature corresponding to 1 electron volt is 10,000 degree Kelvin. So, when a collection of particles are at a temperature 10,000 degree Kelvin, then the average energy of a 
of any particle in the system is about one electron volt. And therefore, once the universe cools down to about 10,000 degree Kelvin, earlier the universe was hotter. So when the universe cools down to about 10,000 degree Kelvin, the average energy of particles cannot dissociate a neutral hydrogen atom because energy required to completely dissociate a hydrogen atom is 13.6 electron volt. Okay. And so when the universe was around three times 10 to the power five years, the universe had cooled down to about 10,000 degrees Kelvin. And therefore, that time, the proton and the electrons, they had combined to form neutral hydrogen atom. And this is about 75% weight was in the form of hydrogen and 24% of the weight was in the form of helium and rest of the 1% were other light elements like deuterium, lithium and so on. Now, a great thing happened when neutral elements were formed, when neutral hydrogen was formed because the universe was cooled. A great thing happened. There was background radiation. Because remember, when the universe was very hot, there was also radiation. Highly relativistic particles and photons, they were also in thermal equilibrium with matter. But when neutral hydrogen formed, radiation effectively stopped interacting with matter. Why is it so? Because radiation or photons, they only interact with charged particles. They don't have very good cross-section of interaction with neutral particles. So when neutral hydrogens were formed, the radiation, which was also at a temperature of 10,000 degree Kelvin, the radiation essentially decoupled from the neutral hydrogen atom and the neutral hydrogen atoms and the radiation, they, they thermodynamically decoupled and as the universe expanded, both hydrogen as well as radiation, they started cooling down. But since the radiation was earlier having a black body spectrum because it was in thermodynamic equilibrium, the radiation continued to maintain a black body spectrum except that the temperature of the radiation kept falling. This was a prediction by George Gamow and his collaborators like uh, Alpher and uh, others who had predicted, who had looked at the uh, thermodynamics and Big Bang nucleosynthesis, they had predicted that when the universe cools down below 10,000 degree Kelvin, there will be a relic radiation black body background. This was in 1940s. In 1940s, George Gamow and his collaborators had predicted that after the formation of neutral hydrogen in the universe, radiation would have decoupled and there should be a relic black body radiation. And then what happened was very interesting. That cosmologists were already interested in looking at this relic background radiation that was predicted from George Gamow's work of uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis and a very extraordinary relativist experimental uh, astrophysicist called Dickey. Dickey was already building an instrument to measure this relic background radiation. But 
Unfortunately to Dicky, something else happened. What happened was the two engineers, Arno Penzias and Wilson, they were microwave engineers. They were trying to build a microwave receiver, a horn antenna. In this picture, you can see the very large horn antenna. And they were trying to build a microwave receiver to detect microwave radiation. What is a microwave radiation? As you know, the electromagnetic spectrum, they can be classified based on their wavelength. Already we know that the visible spectrum, the range of the visible spectrum is from about 400 nanometer to about 800 nanometer. While ultraviolet radiation, their wavelength is below 400 nanometer. While X-rays, X-rays have even shorter wavelength corresponding to energy of X-ray photons being few electron, few kilo electron volts to about 0 0.05, 0 0.08 mega electron volts. But then from 0 0.1 mega electron volts onwards, you have gamma rays. On the longer wavelength side, beyond 800 nanometer, you have infrared waves. But when you find wavelengths of the order of micrometer and millimeter, the wavelength in the range micrometer and millimeter, that is the microwave part of the electromagnetic radiation. Wavelengths longer than few millimeters, they go to the radio, radio wave. Radio waves, as you know, typical radio wave that is used in your radio set or mobile phone is a uh, few centimeters. So for communication purposes, microwaves uh, serve a very useful uh, purposes. And therefore, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson, they wanted to build a very, very sensitive microwave receiver. And they had cooled down. Here is the focus point where the radio waves are collected by this antenna and focused into this region. The detector where the microwave was finally absorbed, all the energy was absorbed, was cooled to liquid helium temperature because they wanted to build very fine receiver, very sensitive receiver. But to their surprise, Penzias and Wilson, they kept seeing a microwave noise. There was a microwave hiss that was not getting eliminated, no matter how they improved, no matter how they improved the detector here or how they tried to uh, cool down so that to so as to eliminate the background noise no matter what they did the they kept on hearing a microwave hiss and they realized that that microwave hiss is not coming from sun because it didn't depend upon uh, the direction of the sun this hiss was all the time present when they talked to cosmologists like Jim Peebles and Dickey, and Dickey and Peebles immediately realized that what Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson had detected was the relic black body radiation that was predicted by George Yamu and his collaborators. So, this discovery of cosmic microwave background immediately established the Big Bang model on firm footing. Okay? And uh, uh, so the this 
discovery by Penzias and Wilson sort of corroborated the Big Bang model. And for that, Penzias and Wilson were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in, bit, in mid 1960s. All right. Now I will stop here and uh, uh, pause to take up questions. Are there any questions? Well, if there are no questions, then I must uh, give you a reference to all these. So this part of the introductory astronomy course, all of you must read a very, very nice account by Steven Weinberg, the book is called The First Three Minutes. So the reference The question that Shubham Gangwar has asked is what is string theory? All right. Well, uh, string theory is a highly mathematical subject uh, which deals about the fundamental theory that unifies gravitation with other forces like electroweak forces and the strong forces, it is still at a theoretical uh, stage because no experimental corroboration of string theory uh, is uh, obtained so far. Basically, in string theory, the fundamental entity is a string moving in a higher dimensional space time where you have one time dimension and nine space dimension out of which out of the nine spatial dimension three of the spatial dimension is our own space the other six spatial dimension are curled up that means they are compact uh, space dimension and this string that propagates in the 10 dimensional space time dimension it has different excitation and different excitation corresponds to different particles remember that the size of the string is of the order of Planck size meaning what the size of the string is of the order of 10 raised to power minus 33 centimeter. 
and in string theory all particles are essentially vibrational excitation of string theory this is the layman version of string theory the actual string theory uh, involves lot of advanced uh, mathematical ideas and i am not uh, a person working in the string theory so therefore whatever i told you is a layman's viewpoint uh, on string theory but uh, in our country country we have uh, stalwart string theorists like ashok sen and rajesh gopakumar and uh, many others who are part of um, uh, arishchandra research uh, institute or uh, tifr icts uh, icer pune and many other places uh, there are very talented and accomplished uh, string theorists and uh, let me tell you if you want to become a string theorist you have to be very very good in advanced mathematics um string theory the tools are uh, tools of pure mathematics like uh, differential geometry uh, the group theory uh, abstract group theory uh, the class lie groups and so on so those who are very very talented in pure mathematics um, they can think of going into string theory right so uh, remember uh, the subject of cosmology that i am uh, discussing uh, the reference book of course frank shue's book is there you must read frank shue's book on uh, the part on cosmology but many of the historical details concerning how penzias and wilson detected the microwave background radiation you can uh, study you can read the popular level book written by the nobel laureate steven weinberg called first 3 minutes are there any more questions if not i will continue all right so since there are no more question let me continue as i said that uh, the microwave background radiation was discovered and then later on many uh, telescopes were sent to space like kobe planck w map and so on to measure the spectrum of the relic radiation of the universe the big bang uh, relic radiation and they found indeed that the spectrum was close so close to a perfect black body spectrum note the experimental errors for the measurement of the black body spectrum concerning the big bang relic is smaller than the thickness of the curve so that is uh, the degree with which the background radiation the thermal radiation uh, was measured and the temperature of the relic radiation is given here it is 2.725 Plus minus point zero zero one degree Kelvin. Okay, so that means the thermal radiation constituting our universe, the entire universe, because of the expansion, the thermal radiation has cooled down to such a low value. What does it mean? It means that when the universe was created, the universe was of course created. in a very hot and dense space as the universe expanded 
just like a ball of hot matter if it expands adiabatically adiabatically means what the ball of hot matter is neither supplied any heat nor you take out heat from it if it expands then the temperature will fall and the universe being an isolated system you can think of as it expanded the temperature kept falling and the when the universe was about 3 lakhs years old the temperature of the universe fell to about 10000 degree kelvin and as i discussed neutral hydrogen atoms were formed so that the radiation got decoupled from the matter and the matter started doing its own uh, thing after 3 lakhs years but the radiation its planck black body shape got fixed as the universe expanded except that the temperature kept falling and the same radiation today when we observe we observe it as microwave background radiation whose spectrum has been measured to such a high accuracy now what happened by the discovery of microwave background radiation was that big bang model got established here i must tell you that there was a rival model of big bang theory called steady state model of the universe the steady state model was created by independently by three cosmologists fred hoyle hadman bondi and thomas gold around the same time in late 1940s around 1948 this three very outstanding cosmologists and astrophysicists fred hoyle thomas gold and h bondi they proposed an alternate model to big bang model called the steady state model you might wonder why did they do so why did they why were they inspired to think of another model after all as i have been telling you the big bang model is older it got established when hubble discovered the expanding universe through his correlation of redshift versus the distance of the galaxies the reason was that during that time the measured value of hubble parameter was very large as i mentioned that today although there is uncertainty in the measured hubble parameter as i said it could be anywhere between 67 kilometers per second per megaparsec to about 75 kilometers per second per megaparsec there is an uncertainty even today in the measurement of the hubble parameter but around 1940s the hubble parameter was estimated the uncertainty was very great and measured value was close to few hundred around 600 kilometers per second per megaparsec such a large value and this large value was in conflict with the age of the universe and age of the earth age of the earth was already geologist by doing various radioactive dating had measured the age of the earth and the age of the earth was already measured to be about several billion years 
old. Okay. While if the Hubble constant is as high as 600 kilometers per second per megaparsec, then the age of the universe, remember, we have already discussed, 1 divided by the Hubble parameter H0 roughly gives us the age of the universe. Again, why is it so? It again forms, uh, it comes from the Hubble relation. Hubble relation says that velocity of recession is Hubble parameter times distance. Okay. So therefore, if I divide by V both sides and divide by H, you'll get 1 by Hubble parameter is distance divided by speed. If you take Hubble's picture that galaxies were thrown out with different velocities, then distance divided by the speed will tell us the age of the universe because distance divided by speed Distance traveled is speed multiplied by the age of the universe. So distance, distance gets cancelled. Distance divided by speed becomes age of the universe. And that is equal to 1 over Hubble parameter. So even from Hubble's naive law that recession velocity is Hubble parameter times distance, we get the idea that 1 over H0, 1 over Hubble parameter, which is equal to distance divided by V, which is of the order of the age of the universe. So therefore, if Hubble parameter is as high as 600 kilometers per second per megaparsec, then 1 over Hubble parameter becomes less than the age of the universe. Higher the value of H, H0, 1 over H0 is smaller. So with such a high value of Hubble parameter, the age of the universe turned out to be smaller than Earth's age. But that is ridiculous. Because Earth is one of the entities of the universe and therefore Earth cannot be older than the universe itself. And that is the time when Thomas Gold, Fred Hoyle, Herman Bondi, they proposed a new model saying that the universe always appears the same no matter at what point one looks at the universe. That means although the universe is expanding. After all, Hubble's discovery already said that the distance between galaxies were increasing with time. But the universe still will always look the same according to the steady state model. But how do you accomplish this? If the universe is expanding, then you would expect that the density of galaxies will decrease with time, right? Because the universe is expanding, if the galaxies are moving away from each other, then the density of galaxies will keep on decreasing. But here, Hoyle, Gold and Bondi through their steady state model were claiming that no, the universe is described by a steady state model in which the universe appears the same no matter when you observe the universe. This can happen only if matter is created in the vacuum so that as the galaxies move away from each other, new galaxies are formed so that the density of the galaxies remain the same no matter at what time you look at the universe. So the steady state model where making Copernican, where elevating Copernican principle 
which was about space that is no point in space is special they were elevating it to the time domain also that means no point of time no instant of time is special at every instant of time the universe on very large scale looks the same and that could happen if the universe looks the same on large scale and or, or and on long time scales the same then it is necessary that matter must be created between the galaxies so that new galaxies are created in order that the number density of galaxies remain the same this steady state model how do you create matter in space to account for the average density of matter remaining same although the universe was expanding this was done by hoyle's phd student jayant vishnu narlikar so jayant vishnu narlikar an outstanding mathematical physicist as a young man he got a fellowship uh, to study in cambridge and he performed uh, brilliantly in the tripos exam in the cambridge university and joined fred hoyle for his phd and uh, they did various outstanding work in particular the hoyle narlikar theory of c fields they discussed how if there is a c field then the c field c for capital c representing probably a cosmological field so this capital c field was invoked by hoyle and jant narlikar to account for creation of matter and uh, narlikar and hoyle they related this creation of matter with marx principle some other time i'll also talk about marx principle which relates the notion of inertia with the presence of distant matter and they created a new theory of gravity also called the hoyle narlikar theory action at a distance theory of gravitation they were all part to explain the steady state model for the universe but as soon as cosmic ray sorry as soon as cosmic microwave background radiation was discovered by wilson and penzia and thereby the big bang model was corroborated steady state model received a setback so from mid 1960s onwards it was the big bang model that gained scientific corroboration and slowly steady state model faded away but then of course uh, uh hoyle and narlikar and burbage they uh, talked about a quasi steady state model in mid 1990s and uh, they tried to resurrect the steady state model uh, but as of now the observational evidence is in favor of big bang model so so far whatever has been observed seems to favor the big bang model but remember big bang model has still many uncertainties like what is the dark matter constituent what is dark energy so there are problems even with big bang model there are many unsolved puzzles associated with the big bang model namely what are the dark matter we will talk about dark matter 
in my next lecture uh, what is dark matter what is the dark energy that shows um, uh, an accelerated expansion of the universe so let me summarize the big bang model so in the big bang model there is a scale roughly describing the distance between the galaxies so imagine that uh, there is a scale which is a function of time that describes the size of the observable universe and big bang model says that around 13.8 billion years ago the universe was created with that scale a of t going to zero that means 1 over a cube which is proportional to the density of the matter that was close to infinity when the universe was created and there are various kinds of big bang model possible depending on the matter that is uh, that the universe is constituted of so in one model if the density of matter is very large then the scale factor remember what is the scale factor it is a time dependent scale that roughly tells us the observable size of the universe so in one of the model corresponding to density being greater greater than some critical density the universe keeps expanding and that scale attains a maximum value then again the universe starts collapsing and it finally it collapses in a big crunch such a big bang model is a is called a closed model you could have another kind of model in which the scale factor a of t during the big bang it was zero zero meaning close to planck size 10 to the power minus 33 cm it expanded and here there can be two possible models one is the open model in the open model the scale factor keeps increasing with time that so keeps on expanding scale factor keeps increasing with time but the rate of expansion that means time derivative of the scale factor keeps going down as the universe is expanding why because after all gravity is attractive so therefore although it is expanding but the rate at which it is expanding that rate keeps decreasing with time and so this is the open model where the scale factor keeps increasing indefinitely such a model is called open universe then there is a universe called einstein de sitter universe or sometimes called the flat universe in which the scale factor increases but for time tending to infinity the scale factor reaches a finite limit but at all finite time the universe keeps expanding the scale factor keeps in expanding then there are other models like coasting universe where the scale factor increases linearly with time the scale factor a of t is proportional to time so that's why scale factor goes like a straight line as a function of time but what is surprising was that around 1995 and so perlmutter schmidt and rise they independently remember i talked about the standard candle called type 1a supernova where you have a white dwarf and a companion binary system and as the mass from the companion star falls on the white dwarf the white dwarf's mass keeps on increasing and when it hits 1.4 the so called chandrashekhar critical limit the white dwarf implodes and there is a explosion 
such type 1a supernovae act like standard candle so rise schmidt and um perlmutter using the type 1a supernovae when they looked at the way the apparent magnitude and the redshift relation they found that actually the universe when the universe was sufficiently older the universe expansion rate the so called time derivative of the scale factor is actually increasing with time okay so that is very strange as, as i said that attractive nature of gravity means that although the scale factor is increasing with time the rate at which scale factor is changing that rate must be going down here rise spermutter and uh, schmidt they were saying that not only universe expanding expansion of the universe has been known since the hubble's uh, discovery but the rate at which the universe expanding that itself is increasing with time that means the expansion is accelerating that means that there has to be some weird kind of substance in the universe which cause anti gravity and this weird substance is called the dark energy what is this dark energy no one knows is it einstein's cosmological constant or is it some exotic matter for which pressure is highly negative einstein general relativity shows that if you have energy density plus 3 times pressure to be negative such a weird matter can explain repulsive gravity that follows from einstein's general relativity in other words what i am trying to say is although big bang model so far all observations show that big bang model is a better cosmological model compared to steady state model but there are lot of unsolved questions concerning the big bang model namely what is this dark energy which causes the late time universe to be accelerating that means the scale factor is increasing in an accelerated fashion when the universe is sufficiently older that means today the universe is expanding at an accelerated rate all right and this is this business of dark energy is not understood similarly the business of dark matter is also not understood properly although the proper quantification of dark matter analysis i will do it in tomorrow's lecture but let me qualitatively explain how the dark matter idea came about remember that i have already told you that there are clusters of galaxy and there are some rich clusters of galaxy called abel clusters of galaxy because astronomer abel he observed rich clusters of galaxies and created a catalog the abel the abel catalog of clusters of galaxy the clusters contain contain typically around 1000 galaxies so imagine about 1000 galaxies are gravitationally bound to each other what do i mean by gravitationally bound to each other remember we have already talked 
when I was discussing virial theorem, etc., there I talked about the fact that for a bound system, gravitationally bound system, the total energy, meaning kinetic energy plus the potential energy of the constituent member of a bound system must be negative. Only when kinetic energy plus potential energy is negative, they will be in a compact, they will confine themselves in a compact region. Why? Because if the energy was zero or positive, the constituent members of the system could have gone further away from each other without any bound. Okay? But in order a system of discrete object be confined to a compact region, the total energy must be negative so that they can't go beyond a particular size. Finally, of course, the size can be inferred by invoking Virial theorem. So in tomorrow's lecture, I will actually apply Virial's theorem to clusters of galaxy to infer that a rich cluster like a Abel cluster of galaxy can remain bound only if there is additional matter other than the matter which is made out of protons, electrons and neutrons. And this is for the first time was done by one of the outstanding astronomers named Zwicky. It was Zwicky when he studied the coma cluster, he realized that the typical velocities of the galaxy, the random velocity of the galaxy in a cluster, the typical velocity is very large, larger than about 1000 kilometer per second. Note the value, 1000 kilometer per second. No object on Earth can move with such high velocity. As you know, Earth itself is going around Sun at a velocity of order 20 to 22 kilometers per second. The solar system is going around the center of our Milky Way galaxy at a velocity of the order of 200 kilometers per second. While in the Abel cluster, the galaxies typically move randomly within the cluster with a velocity, with a speed, 1000 kilometers per second, very large speed. And when Zwicky estimated the mass, total mass of the galaxy, how did it estimate? He said that, well, galaxies are made out of stars. You can count the number of stars in a galaxy from its luminosity. And if each star has a mass similar to the sun's mass, then you can get the total mass of the cluster, which is made out of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And he found that this mass is too low. Such high velocity galaxies would escape from the total mass of the uh, cluster. But how is it then that these clusters are in a compact region? It can't be accidental because it is too much of a coincidence that you are seeing today all these galaxies are all very nearby to each other, um, so close to each other. Unless they are bound, the probability of seeing all these galaxies roughly of same distance from us to be so close to each other. And Zwicky argued that there must be matter which don't emit light and therefore we can't see them. 
only their gravitational effects are felt by other galaxies because of which the galaxies are bound to each other all right then came so this is another abel cluster of galaxy you can see these are the members of the um, uh, cluster all these galaxies normally all abel cluster they have a huge elliptical galaxy called cd galaxy at the center very large galaxy they are referred to as cd galaxy the other evidence for dark matter came from vera rubin's work of observation of distant stars and neutral hydrogen clouds very far away from galaxies again here i will qualitatively uh, discuss what vera rubin had done imagine that you have a spiral galaxy all right the spiral galaxy has a bulge at the center of the bulge as we have discussed earlier there will be a supermassive black hole but away from the bulge you have the spiral arms if the barred spiral galaxy the bulge would be coincident with a bar like structure and then of course the spiral arms will begin spiral arms are the regions where the density of gas is very high and because of that stars are being formed young stars are being formed and that's the reason spiral arms look very very bright okay and the stars are seen up to a particular uh, radial distance from the center after you go away from that distance hardly you will find any star for a spiral galaxy but there will be neutral hydrogen clouds small neutral hydrogen clouds even beyond the farthest arm of a spiral galaxy so what B vera rubin she decided was to look at the 21 cm lines from this neutral hydrogen clouds remember long time back i talked to you about the 21 cm lines that emerge from neutral hydrogen what are these 21 cm lines because protons and electrons have intrinsic spin angular momentum and because proton is a positively charged particle having a spin angular momentum electron is a negatively charged particle having also spin angular momentum because of this both proton and electron they are like magnetic dipole moment because tiny currents circular currents electrical current tiny circular currents always create magnetic dipole moment and magnetic dipole moment of the proton and electron in a hydrogen atom they interact with each other and therefore the ground state is split into two levels depending upon whether the proton spin and electron spins are parallel that they are pointing in the same direction or anti parallel that means proton spin direction is opposite to that of electrons uh spin angular moment and because of this interaction the ground state energy level which we had already discussed the ground state energy level n equal to one state if you don't uh include this interaction between the two magnetic dipole moments then the energy level corresponds to energy minus 13.6 electron volt but when you switch on the magnetic dipole moment magnetic dipole moment interaction the level gets split and the spacing between the two split level if there's a transition then that transition that means if it transits from one of the excited hyperfine split level to the 
lower level will emit a photon whose wavelength is 21 centimeter or equivalently its frequency is 1420 megahertz all right so these are something i had discussed earlier concerning the hyperfine splitting of the hydrogen energy level and the observation of 21 cm line and as i had uh, mentioned earlier that one of the prime um, a purpose of giant meter radio telescope which was pioneered by late professor govind swarup was to detect this 21 cm line from distant hydrogen clouds that are uh, creating the galaxies and lot of work in gmrt is taking place using this red shifted 21 cm lines so vera rubin in 1970s she uh, her story i mean sometime if you have time you can read her story that how she was she had to struggle to get telescope time to observe the 21 cm lines from the neutral hydrogen clouds so she observed the 21 cm line from the neutral hydrogen cloud for different galaxies and because the neutral hydrogen clouds for spiral galaxy they were also rotating about the center of the galaxies she plotted the rotational velocity inferred from the doppler shift of the 21 cm line here the neutral hydrogen clouds were really moving and therefore the shift either the blue shift or the red shift of the 21 cm line was actually happening because of the doppler shift and from the doppler shift vera rubin and her team members they could estimate the rotational velocity of these neutral hydrogen clouds and they when they plotted the rotational velocity as a function of the distance of this neutral hydrogen cloud from the center of the galaxy they found typically that the rotational velocity of the neutral hydrogen cloud they tend to flatten out they increase for a while and then they tend to flatten out. vera rubin was surprised by it why was she surprised so i'll give you a qualitative argument as to why she was surprised because the stars of a spiral galaxy they were predominantly seen up to this size for example in this plot up to about 40000 light years you see stars beyond about 40000 light years radial distance you don't see any stars so if you assume that the entire mass is here after all the neutral hydrogen clouds are very few in number they are just like test particles the total mass in the neutral hydrogen cloud is very small so if you say that entire mass of the galaxy is bounded up to this point then applying the centripetal acceleration being given by the total mass you would expect v square by r to be equal to gm by r square where m is the mass of the galaxy and therefore v square must be equal to gm by r so you would expect that as you go further and further away because v square is gm by r so v is square root of gm by r as you go to larger distance this speed rotational speed must decrease as 1 over square root of radial distance but actual observation the neutral hydrogen cloud rotational velocity says that no it doesn't go down it flattens up so what is 
the cause of flattening of the rotational curve. Tomorrow, I will give you the calculation, simple calculation. These are all Newtonian uh, calculations. Simple calculation that will be the subject uh, of my talk tomorrow tells us that in order to explain the flat rotation curve, there must be additional matter present. That means there must be a halo, some dark matter halo around the galaxy, which makes that V square by R equal to GM total by R square. So this M total, as you go to larger and larger distance, the enclosed M total must also increase. Only then you can explain the flat rotation curve. And therefore, spiral galaxies and later on for elliptical galaxies also is were discovered. They are embedded inside halo, which don't show up in light or any other electromagnetic spectrum. Their discovery is only through their gravitational influence. Here is another picture showing the observed data point coming from the 21 centimeter line. Here is a spiral galaxy, as you can see, boundary of the spiral galaxy, that means boundary after which the stars are not present are only up to this point. And you would expect that the rotation speed must fall with distance, but the actual data that were measured for the first time by Vera Rubin and her teammates showed that for some galaxies, in fact, the rotational velocity, so the blue lines are from 21 centimeter observation of the far flung neutral hydrogen clouds, while the yellow lights are for the stars. And indeed, even for the stars, some of the far flung stars, instead of falling down, they show an increase, demonstrating that there must be dark matter. Here is another example of elliptical galaxy. And for the elliptical galaxy, when you measure the uh, rotational velocity, you see that further away, the distance increases. So today, the picture that we have is that if you take a spiral galaxy, then most of the matter and stars are lying in a disk. There are of course globular clusters forming a spheroidal halo. Globular clusters move randomly. But the total mass in the globular cluster is less than the total mass of the stars in the disk. But the rotation, flattening of the rotation velocity of the neutral hydrogen cloud and also far flung stars suggest that every galaxy is embedded inside a spheroidal halo made out of mysterious dark matter particles. So dark matter particles are those which have no electromagnetic interaction. They only can have weak interaction. But of course, gravity is anyway universal. So their presence has been inferred from their gravitational uh, influence, whether it is the clusters as inferred by Zwicky or whether it is for the spiral galaxies as inferred by Vera Rubin and her teammate or later for elliptical galaxies. So I will stop here. Tomorrow we will continue uh, uh, the more simple but quantitative analysis of dark matter. And uh, if you have any questions, you can ask. Again, 
all these can be read from uh, the Frank Shu's book. Shivangi is asking uh, that cosmic background, radiation background, um, uh, whether from Steven Weinberg's book, only chapter three is sufficient. Yes, uh, for the time being, you can only read up to chapter three for Weinberg's book. You need not talk about, read the Big Bang nucleosynthesis that <clears throat> Weinberg discusses in the book, but you also read cosmic background radiation, the Big Bang model, as well as dark matter from Frank Shu's book, The Physical Universe, and do the simple numerical problems that Frank Shu has given. Yes, so tomorrow uh, I have some work. Uh, 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 early in the morning. So tomorrow we will uh, start our class at 11 a.m. if it is all right with you. So if it is all right, Tomorrow, we can start the class at 11 a.m. By the way, uh, the classes will stop by 25th of November because exams, um, preparatory leave for uh, exams will be uh, there. As you know, uh, the date sheet uh, ha has been internally circulated among all of us, all the faculty members, and uh, introductory astronomy exam is on 12th of December. Uh, so, I will circulate another uh, assignment that will be the last assignment set uh, either tomorrow or uh, day after tomorrow. I will circulate the last assignment uh, set and uh, uh, probably theory lecture wise, uh, tomorrow is the last lecture. But if you wish, we can have another lecture on next week, Saturday, just to clear doubts. No lecture, no new topic will be covered, but we can discuss any doubt on Saturday next week, if it is all right with you. Yes, I will uh, uh, circulate. Uh, I hope to uh, circulate the internal assessment uh, marks um, sometime in the middle of the uh, coming week. And I will uh, first uh, circulate them uh, to you. And then um, the final submission will be done later. So is it all right then we also meet Next week, Saturday. Tomorrow, of course, we are meeting at 11 o'clock. But next week, Saturday, we can uh, have a Google Meet. We can have a Google Meet to discuss the, uh, the assignment set that I'm going to send. By now, you have some idea as to uh, what the exam would be like, it will be simple uh, numerical problems, the way uh, our assignments and internal assessment uh, described. So, but you have to keep practicing doing numerical problems. Are there 
uh, any questions from whatever i have discussed so far need not be just today's lecture but even previous lecture are there any questions all right if there are no further question then i will end the broadcast and uh, so we will meet again tomorrow at 11 o'clock so uh, goodbye take care and stay safe okay before there's another question i can see uh, jyoti ranjan is asking what is microwave background radiation so as i discussed in the lecture so let me go back to the slide as i said that when as the big bang universe expanded and cooled down when the matter of the universe cooled down to less than 1 electron volt they became neutral neutral hydrogen atoms as you know photons don't interact with neutral particles photons interact with charged particles as well as they get scattered from charge distribution but because neutral hydrogen atom just proton and electron effective charge is zero so no absorption or emission would take place when radiation interact with atom only scattering due to uh, the electronic cloud uh, of the hydrogen atom but the scattering cross section is very low compared to actual absorption or uh, emission but since the background radiation the energy is has fallen to less than 1 electron volt they cannot dissociate a neutral hydrogen atom and the interaction cross section rapidly falls to zero when universe cools below 1 electron volt and therefore radiation the thermal bath of radiation all those black body photons of each average energy less than 1 electron volt they can't anyway any more interact with the hydrogen atoms so they decouple from the matter which is largely made out of hydrogen atoms and helium at helium atoms but the thermal radiation their spectrum is still the planck spectrum and as the universe expands the planck spectrum maintains but the corresponding temperature falls as one over scale factor so as universe expands you have the black body spectrum but the temperature of the black body monotonically decreases and today we expect the black body temperature the black body spectrum of the photons to be of this form at this temperature because of the expansion so in other words big other words big bang model predicts as shown by george gamow and his collaborators that because of the expansion the thermal distribution of photons they will maintain a black body shape the planckian shape but because of the expansion the temperature will keep falling in fact gamo and his collaborators had predicted a 10 degree kelvin relic radiation it was an overestimate but what penzias and wilson they measured was 3 degree kelvin but today 
with Kobe satellite, WMAP, Planck satellite, their uh, observation tell us that the temperature of this background relic of thermal photons is 2.725 degree Kelvin. And because of the Rayleigh, uh, sorry, genes approximation, the maximum intensity is at a wavelength. Look at the maximum intensity. It is at a wavelength of about 0.18 centimeter. It corresponds to the microwave region of the electromagnetic spectrum. And that is the reason why this thermal relic of photons left behind uh, from the hot Big Bang model is described as the cosmic microwave background radiation. So Jyoti Ranjan, uh, uh, please go through the microwave background section of Weinberg's first three minutes. It is he describes it in a very delightful way so that you will get a nice physical idea about um, uh, the hot Big Bang model, its expansion, and how when the universe gets cold enough, the radiation decouples from the matter. All right. Uh, so we will end the broadcast now broadcast now and we will uh, reassemble tomorrow at 11, uh, 11 a.m.